hi Juliana and hi everyone who is watching uh, this class at this moment. Hi Roxana, hi everyone. In this class, we intend to share with you some of the problems, the challenges, constraints and potentialities we see in regards to internationalization of higher education. And to do that, we divided our class into two parts. The first part is an attempt to consider the possibility of engaging in experiences of internationalization that escape the historical global north and global south divide. And the second part is an attempt to share a pedagogical approach we have been discussing about. And to start this class, we it's good to start with what do we mean with Global South? So we conceptualize Global South as a historical, political, economic, and cultural division that started with the invasion of Columbus in the Americas or in Abjayala as the local people used to name the American continent. So we can go back much earlier than the division of nation states. When we start with this narrative uh, in, 19, in 1492, we find the beginning of modernity much earlier than what has been told by European perspective of global history. The encounter between the indigenous peoples and the Spaniards inaugurated this complex binary identities, such as modern versus primitive, European versus not European, global south versus global north. And it's important to look back at our past to understand and scrutinize our present. And this is our intention in this conversation. So adding to what Hoxana was saying, Global South as a concept is not just geographical. It reflects the people, lands, traditions, knowledges that have paid the greatest cost of colonization. So in this sense, Global South is defined as an epistemological concept. This means that everything that has been projected to the other side of the abyssal line, a term coined by Boaventura de Souza Santos. That's why we find scholars researching Global South perspectives and engaging in Global South concepts, or we could say the epistemologies of the South, even when they do not recognize themselves in a geographical Global South. So in this sense, Global South is an epistemological concept. And also we can consider that in a geographical Global South, there is Global North. And in a geographical Global North, there is also Global South. For instance, someone may think that all scholars in Brazil are located within the Global South. But within Brazil, there are some universities and scholars whose views and positions represent a Global North perspective as they are very much informed by Eurocentric views and interests. So in other, in, in other words, in epistemological terms, Global South and Global North are always in tension. They represent the historical hierarchies that constitute our existence. That is such a good point, Juliana. Expanding concept instead of reducing their possibilities. These tensions you mentioned are entangled in different domains of our lives. So if we agree that Global South is an epistemic concept that includes the lands, the peoples, the individuals, the knowledges who have paid the cost of coloniality, we can consider that internationalization and all our experience in the social world are always constrained or conditioned by the colonial history who have shaped these hierarchies. In that sense, perhaps it could be good to just stop for a moment and unpack what we mean by coloniality. This is a key concept for us. Coloniality gets reproduced and produced in our local realities, either uh, in the macro level, across countries, institutions of all types, and also among ourselves, individuals, in micro interactions. A critical question to understand its effects until nowadays is why there is a racial hierarchy that has not been disrupted since the end of the formal occupation of colonies in the American, Asian, African, and Oceania continents. 
Here, some important distinction between colonization and coloniality. Colonization is a process of domination in which an external group subjugates others by taking control of their people, lands, waters, and ways of living. As it's widely known, after Cristobal Columbus' arrival in the American continent, few European nations took control over the American, Asian, African, and Oceania continents. These processes of domination were justified in the superiority of white European settlers. In that way, colonizers imposed their knowledges, their languages, their ways of being at the expense of indigenous and black population and their practices. These indigenous people who inhabited the, these um, colonies. Coloniality, colonialism, or colonial legacy is the continuity of colonial forms of domination after the end of colonization produced by colonial cultures and structures in the modern colonial capitalist patriarchal world system. You are seeing this definition on the screen and just pay attention to that last uh, phrase, modern colonial capitalistic patriarchal world system, a term uh, described by Gross Fogel, who is part of one, one of our readings. Uh, thanks, Roxana, for uh, emphasizing that because this modern colonial capitalist patriarchal world system is manifested in the interdependence between coloniality and modernity. And it's important to highlight here that modernity and coloniality are inseparable. They are constitutive of one another. That's why we write modernity slash coloniality. Anibal Quijano, the Peruvian decolonial scholar, argues that the promises of modernity, such as the idea of national independent states, the role of scientific knowledge in the economic progress and development, the notion of democracy and social justice that we have nowadays, among many other elements, have operated in ways that contribute to hide the violences exerted to Black, indigenous women, working class populations, as Roxana was just explaining. So that's why when we hear discourses in defense of progress, development, the benefits of technology, economic advances, we find these courses praising modernity and hiding coloniality. Modernity coloniality result from the history of colonization. But of course that what we are not, we are not saying that we still live under colonial conditions, as in colonialism. What we are saying is that what we call today globalization is the result of this colonial history. And that's why even when countries, previous colonies, reached their administrative and political independence, all those hierarchies we are, we are mentioning before still exist. So this is the reason why some Latin American scholars say it's an illusion to believe that we live in a post-colonial world. Modernity coloniality is expressed in many different elements that constitute ourselves, such as race, ethnicity, language, knowledge. All those elements are always defined and projected as superior or inferior in relation to one another. Thank you for saying all of that, Juliana. And that reminds me a phrase that our dear colleague Lee Mario Meneses de Sosa says all the time. There is no single place on planet Earth nor individual that has been exempted from the effects of colonization and modernity. I really appreciate the historical context because I think one of the issues that higher education scholars and practitioners usually do is that unintentionally there is a tendency to erase the historicity of internationalization and globalization and we start talking about these events as if they were neutral with no cost and as you just explained globalization is what some decolonial scholars call another facet of coloniality I, and I say this is another facet of coloniality because the integration of the world economy, facilitated by technological advances and communicational advances, has been driven by a neoliberal discourse and 
has all of that has happened within the colonial entanglements. So this historical and political approach to define globalization completely changes our understanding of internationalization as well. A common definition of internationalization for many years presented in many books has been that is a result, is a response of globalization. This means that, that the phenomenon of accelerating the communication flow, the people flow, the product, the commerce was happened like in a vacuum. So we see it that internationalization and globalization is a result of the colonial history entangled in modernity and coloniality, much more implicated in hierarchies than just in benefits. Yeah, that's an excellent point to start complicating the conversations about higher education, understanding the hierarchies and not just the benefits, because higher education is entangled in the global order. That's why local decisions are impacted by global forces, transnational flows. For instance, we find here in, in my context as well, in Brazil, we find national educational policies and funding research opportunities driven by transnational interests. This means that we cannot deny the impact multilateral organizations are having in educational institutions, such as the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and even some foundations such as Lehman Foundation, for example. Just to mention a few examples here, their interest is not educational per se, and the most serious issue is the fact that they interfere in pedagogical practices at the moment they decide on how some of the educational investments should be done. And along with that, we find a business rationality interfering with local educational practices, decisions, and discourses. So locally, we start believing that to reach quality in education and to have a reliable administration of our own institutions, we must follow international and managerial standards. That's why we see, for instance, that there are more incentives to publish in English, agreements with Global North partners, mobility to renowned institutions, the pressure to enhance productivity, new curriculum designs adapted according to international standards, projects that count as internationalization while others do not, new assessment criteria to evaluate courses, programs, scholars, staff, and the list could go on. The important thing is to see that the consequence is that driven by this neoliberal logic, rather than educational purposes and intercultural experiences, international education homogenizes practices and experiences, becomes a commodity and repeats and reinforces modernity and coloniality. You just has given us a long list of all of those manifestation um, of internationalization and it's um, how it re it's reproduced those hierarchies and attempts of homogenizing complex systems. And another important example is academic mobility, which until now has been one of the main manifestation of internationalization of higher education. Academic mobility flow, as you may know, is unequal. The percentage, the proportion of students coming from the global south to the global north tends to be much higher than the opposite. And in this case, we can highlight global south and north in epistemic terms. For instance, the flow of students going from Latin American countries to the US and Canada and some other Western European countries. And at the same time, we see students from smaller cities and local institutions moving to universities in big centers that are considered more prestigious. These flows are very much informed by what constitutes the notion of scientific knowledge and scientific capacity. These notions portray the image that the good knowledge or the higher knowledge is present in certain spaces, but not in others. Isn't at least awkward that an international student from Latin America should pay three or four times more to study at a university in Spain? 
This means an institution located in a country that has enriched after exploring Latin America. This is just to give an example of many that we could mention. And that effect that international students pay higher fees in, in countries such as Spain is one of the events that we see how internationalization is reproducing uh, colonial hierarchies. So that was a very good example, because if we do not understand the hierarchies, we are not going to understand how we can change internationalization. So what we are emphasizing here is the fact that internationalization has always been a historical, cultural, and political process associated with modernity and coloniality. And for us, there is no way of discussing internationalization without considering all the inequalities and hierarchies it reproduces. But now, going back to the original question that inspired this conversation, is it possible to generate internationalization projects that can embrace internationalization otherwise, this is beyond the modern colonial university model that was birthed in the West and exported elsewhere? What do you think, Huxana? So my first answer to your question is no. It's not possible that we can escape from the effects of coloniality in any type of internationalization project. We cannot discard the colonial entanglements. Just the experience of traveling by bus or plane is associated with the transnational industry of fossil fuels, which is deeply interconnected with a larger geopolitical discussion and highly responsible for the current climate crisis. Also, we cannot simply forget that the university as an institution is part of the nation state project. It is complicit with the missionary intention of schooling the world, privileging singular views. Its epistemological foundation is Eurocentric and the academic knowledge has most of its foundation on colonial and settler experiences. On the other hand, I also think, and I'm very convinced about that, that the fact that we understand the entanglement doesn't impede us, people in academia, to seek for alternatives of engaging across national borders beyond the existing logics of competitions, productivity, whiteness, social justice based on a status quo or religious mission. And here I think is the uh, uh, important difference. Instead of affirming whether or seeking to embrace internationalization otherwise, our starting point, our first starting point should be unpacking problems, contradictions and limitations as we have been trying to do so far because we can only start this process acknowledging that the colonial critique happens within modernity. And there is an important first step that sits with the discomfort. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Acknowledging that is the first step. And perhaps if we delink from this pragmatic will, will of finding easy solutions to complicated problems, as well as consider the limits of the intellectual critique as well, we might enter in different conversations. We might see potentialities in our academic work and educational practices. So in that sense, our proposal for this class is to share here some of the points that we have been co-elaborating as a pedagogy of decentering with a decolonial intention. And it's important to emphasize that it's a decolonial intention. So this pedagogy of decentering is about a systematic exercise of decentering what in our surroundings has appeared to us as the reference, the canon or center. And it's significant because every time we center something or we center someone, something else or someone else is excluded. And the logic of centering turns into a never ending cycle of exclusion and separation. Let's take, for example, Eurocentrism. Some Western European countries appear at the center of the world history and this impacts differently all beings across the globe, depending on where each one is located. 
That's why in this pedagogy, the main point is to see where we are located, what we have been centering and why, in order to scrutinize what has been reproduced in modernity coloniality and become aware of its consequences and impacts. So the exercise is meant to be a self-learning possibility within entanglements, limits and discomfort. For us, this pedagogy has also been a way to connect essential elements in our studies, such as the colonial history, the entanglements of modernity coloniality, our own locus of enunciation or where we are placed, not just geographically, but epistemically as well. So from where we speak, and our own systematic search of decentry. We understand that this pedagogy of decentry invites us to acknowledge how our current existence happens within coloniality and modernity. And from there, it invites us to engage in a systematic search of decentry. Some people might be asking, how this pedagogy of the centering should be implemented. And we would like to highlight here that our intention is not to provide easy solutions to complicated problems, as we, we have just said. That's why we understand that our contribution in this class is to share the potentialities we see in an educational pedagogy that intends to identify, interrogate, and interrupt modernity and coloniality. Thank you, Juliana, for giving us that introduction of what the pedagogy of the century is. The intention of this pedagogy brings a precondition, which is to acknowledge our coexistence and relationality. You, I, we as living beings have an intrinsic relational nature. We exist in relationship to others and others exist in relationships to us. Our existence exists in relationality. It depends on and relates to other things. Can we agree on that? We truly recognize our coexistence. When we do that, we learn about entanglements and how our existence coexists within a larger universe. In this sense, the coloniality invites us to acknowledge that the separation between human and non-human, or cultures and nature, is not true. What we have had is a Cartesian division that centered humanity on the planet. So assuming that you have, we have acknowledged this relational nature, the first invitation of the pedagogy of the centering is to search for the sake of searching without a definite or predetermined outcome. This means not searching for answers or solution. Yes, no answer or solution, but searching with trust and curiosity to explore possibilities and potentiality. Our colleague Vanessa Andreotti suggests that four type of knowledges that we are using in this pedagogy and you are seeing those type of knowledges on the screen. What we know that we know, what we know that we don't know, what we don't know that we know, and what we don't know that we don't know. And also searching for the sake of searching is learning with no definite outcome. And this is important to be understood because it changes our learning experience and also the understanding we have about learning. Because this is an embodied experience. This means that these domains of knowing that Roxana was just explaining, the four domains, include and recognize the inseparability of mind and body. So the cognitive processes in our mind in connection with our emotions, feelings, corporal senses, and ways of relating with ourselves and others. This is a non-Cartesian view of how we understand the process of knowing and learning. But some of you might be asking, how do we practice this exercise of searching for the sake of searching? 
Our suggestion here is to start with the first two domains of knowing. And we would like to suggest a couple of questions that might guide this search process that can happen in a format of meditation or a writing exercise or a more creative technique, such as drawing, mending, or something else. So the questions we suggest are, what do I know I know? Why do I know in the ways I know? And how do I feel about it? These questions might sound very philosophical or perhaps a little bit heavy, but here is the trick. We can associate these questions to a very concrete top of our, a very concrete topic of our own interest. Let's take, for example, let's explore, for example, how the pedagogy of decentering could be applied in experiences of international mobility, which is a topic that we are here connecting to the internationalization. So I have an example. Let's imagine a group of language teachers who are preparing to travel from a Latin American country to a North American country, either US or Canada, for an exchange program in teacher education. In their home country, they teach English in public schools. They are not native English speakers and they have never been abroad. This trip will be their first international experience. So they are invited to join a preparation course. In this preparation course, the teacher could apply the pedagogy of decentering, and for that, we have to assume the precondition of coexistence and acknowledging the four domains of knowing. The teacher could invite the participants to engage in the exercise of searching for the sake of searching within a decolonial intention. And that intention brings the purpose of interrupting modernity and coloniality. Before starting with the type of question that can be raised, let's remember that context is everything in educational spaces. And as such, issues of positionality of the teacher and the students conditions for having a safe space that can hold a honest conversation need to be taken into consideration. Assuming that all of these conditions are met, the teacher in this preparation course could start saying that what we know and feel about international mobility is part of our body of knowledge. Each one of us, including you that are watching this video, has its own body of knowledge associated with internationalization that is part of what you have read and think of, but also the experiences that you have with the topic. Here we are noticing the first two domain of knowing. What, what do you know that you know? And what do you know that you don't know? The teacher could continue this exercise with questions. What do you know that you know about internationalization or academic mobility? Why do you know in that way? And uh, how do you feel about it? And of course, the teacher could add many more questions to this exercise. And in this example, we, what we see is that a pedagogy of decentering may be a potential pedagogical approach that allows to reconceptualize international academic mobility. International mobility has typically been associated with outcomes presented in terms of quantitative figures, such as numbers of students, number of academics, numbers of agreements, level of satisfaction for the individual level, and so on. But what else can the mobility experience mean between students who meet other people who come from different realities, languages, cultures. This is what the pedagogy of decentering is allowing us to explore. At the same time, there is an intention of using internationalization of higher education as a potential space for the pedagogy of decentering. So in a mobility preparation course, for instance, there is this tendency of paying attention to elements such as documents, visa, papers, health insurance, the exchange currency, some elements associated with the culture of the other country. 
And in these courses, there is less attention to the relational aspects in regards to the participants, to their experiences, and to their personal interests. And even with this focus of interrupting modernity and coloniality. So again, a potentiality of the pedagogy of the centering would be to get to know that international mobility is a relational process. And experiencing mobility as an interrelational complex phenomenon could be seen as an interruption of modernity coloniality. We are actually, with this understanding of internationalization, we are traveling what the common and predominant view of internationalization. And in that way, it's important that the teacher thinks a priori how participants will express this process of searching. It can be an exercise of solo free writing or in a group willing to share their experiences or in a more creative way where the insights can be manifested in a play or some other art expression. And we also know that what we are describing might be unsettling because most of us are used to interventions or methods in education that promise solutions to the injustice, the violence and contradictions that we want to eliminate. And we are here sharing a pedagogy without outcomes and it's, it's not a recipe, yeah? The pedagogy of the centering is a potential approach for self-learning, for self unlearning and for searching and not a promise for solutions and answers. So yet our argument here is that because the roots of coloniality and modernity, we recognize the roots so deep, we cannot bypass the decentering processes. Otherwise we may engage in cosmetic critiques of decolonization that only address the colonial entanglements superficially. We must consider that colonialism has impacted places, communities, nations, populations in very different ways. So the colonial potentialities are also plural and heterogeneous as they are attached to whom is doing the colonial work, from where, for what reasons, and in which ways. In that sense, the pedagogy of the centering doesn't commit with a decolonial outcome but with a decolonial intention. The way we understand it, decolonization is an ongoing process. And the mere fact that we are exploring whether there is any possibility to think of ways to learn and learn and relearn how to foster more plural, equal, just, and critical higher education should be taken into consideration. In this decolonial process, our learning and searching practices are detached from a specific goal or destination because the way we see it, education is not a commodity, is not a service. Education is experiencing discomfort, moving away from our comfort zones, traveling from what we know to what we don't know, forcing us to learn and unlearn in order to reimagine new, multiple and heterogeneous coexistences. So to close this conversation, we would like to invite you to sit down, pause and ask yourself what you have centered in regards to internationalization of higher education. Keep in mind the question that we are projecting on the screen. And if it sounds genuine to you, please email us, uh, sharing your ideas, your question, your maybe criticisms to our approach. We thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you, Juliana, for and engaging in this conversation with me. Thank you, Roxana, for this opportunity of sharing and learning together. It's been a great pleasure to work with you. And we also hope that the suggested readings can expand the understandings and the discussions that we share today with you. Thank you again. Bye-bye, people. Bye-bye.